Good morning, and thank you for coming. I dreaded the day that the grand jury report on child sex abuse within the Catholic Church was to come out. It was, as you know, dragged out all summer long. And when it did, I pretty much stopped everything else I had planned for the day and read most of the report. Since then, I've read all of it, large parts of it, several times. In one sense, there was nothing particularly new. A lot of the stories had been dribbling out over the last 20 years, but seeing it all brought together in one report covering six of the state's eight dioceses was really striking to me. What in particular I noticed from reading the accounts was the pain of the witnesses uh, and the victims uh, and their desire to tell their stories. I heard that again and again. I wanted to tell my story. People didn't believe me. No one would listen. So within these stories, we see the investigation on a grand scale that we've never seen before. Uh, it was really unprecedented. Three separate grand juries totaling six years, tens or not, hundreds of thousands of documents, dozens of witnesses. Just in the last grand jury, the FBI's cooperation, not to mention extensive media coverage. Certainly no other organization has been so thoroughly investigated in regard to child sex abuse as has the Catholic Diocese of Pennsylvania. Part of that is a sense of scope. Uh, it is hands down the largest organization within the state, three and a half million people. One in every four Pennsylvanians is Catholic. That's a large scope to cover. But we see that definitely from the report, the Catholic Church has a significant problem. But it's not just a Catholic problem. As you'll see from your handouts, there are a number of other institutions, organizations, churches, schools that also have child sex abuse in their past, and in many cases, that those instances of abuse were also covered up and concealed over the years. So all of these organizations that have been complicit in this kind of cover-up are part of the fabric of our society. They're pillars on which we depend. Schools, religious institutions, charities, youth organizations. You might not belong to any one particular of these, statute, of these pillars of our society, but they're important. They're important to all of us. We need them all to be strong. And this kind of activity and cover-up damages them all. So out of the grand jury report, we saw several recommendations. Interestingly, only two really addressed past abuse. And in particular, I was struck by the quote which you see, victims need care and compensation for the harm done by the abusers and the institutions that empowered them. And the way you get that is by suing. So if you want justice, go sue. Most victims just want to be heard from what I had heard. But suing is really a terrible way to get justice or to be heard. I'm a lawyer. I know exactly what it means to be involved in lawsuits and follow people through them. In this case, with these types of cases, child sexual abuse cases, they generally begin with legal advertisements. We've actually seen legal advertisements for clerical sexual abuse uh, for years in Pennsylvania. That really draws people in. And one of the things that comes through quite clearly in the, in the, um, uh, in the report uh, was that it takes a long time for victims to really get the courage to see that there are other people that suffer the same kind of abuse that they are. So these legal advertisements actually do serve that purpose. They, they get people to believe that there are others who will listen to their story. Then a suit is filed. Then the court's going to consolidate all those suits because there would be many we would anticipate. From that, we'll have pleadings and responses. This is where victims then have to relive, and it's the first time in this process where their testimony is going to be challenged by someone else. Then there are going to be preliminary matters. In this case, the, uh, the, uh, the report recommended a, a civil window of two years. We already know that there are those who are going to challenge the constitutionality of that as an attorney. I looked at that myself. I think it's constitutionally dubious. It may or may not, but that's really a question that will ultimately be settled if there is a two-year window opened by the state Supreme Court. So that has to be appealed through uh, the Court of Common Pleas and then up to the Superior Court into the Commonwealth Court if indeed you know, there's going to be a, a determination on that. So that's going to take time for that to happen. Then let's say the Supreme Court says that that is constitutional. It gets kicked back into the, into the evidentiary phase where we're collecting testimony and other evidence. There's a substantial amount of written evidence in this case. And then ultimately it goes either to a trial and a judgment or more commonly to a settlement. Now look at what happens with the settlement. There are lots of settlements on these cases. We see them from Minnesota, Delaware, Hawaii, California states that have opened their civil windows. Or we see them in other cases. Just this past week there was a settlement 
uh, from the uh, Penn State uh, um, uh, case involving a fraternity house and an individual who, uh, who died in a fraternity house. There's a settlement there. There were promises made. I think one of the promises was that the fraternity on a national basis was going to make every effort to change the policies in regard to the consumption of alcohol. Will that happen? I mean, it's a settlement, so there's, you know, the, you know, there's no judicial backing necessarily behind it. And although you might have one day's worth of announcements on a settlement like that, all other victims that may not have been part of that uh, aren't necessarily going to know. There's not a great deal of disclosure. And then ultimately what happens after the settlement or a, or a, uh, uh, you know, a judicial um, determination by a court, bankruptcy. Uh, and if we look once again at uh, the opening of the statutory window in Minnesota recently, of the six dioceses, four have declared bankruptcy, the fifth has announced it will, and the sixth presumably will as well. So there's a long span of time between when uh, you know, an individual who has been abused comes forward with their abuse and begins the litigation process and when it ends. Years transpire in, in between. The other thing about litigation is that it is it is adversarial. It pits one side against the other. It's a zero-sum game. You, cannot, you can only win if the other side loses. There's nothing cooperative. Even when there is a settlement, you'd think that's, that's mutually negotiated, but there's nothing cooperative in that process. Once again, as an attorney, I've been through this you know, many times, not in these kinds of cases, but in other cases where you have to, uh, you know, your only ability to win in a case is making sure that the other you know, entity or the other party doesn't. So as I think through this, knowing as an attorney what would be in store for anyone that is going to have to resort to the civil courts, I think, well, what was the demand or what was the request on the part of the uh, report? Was that there be care and compensation? So at the end of litigation, there might ultimately be compensation, uh, but certainly not care. So in that, I think, well, there must be a better way. Lawsuits also tend to incentivize secrecy so again, I, I draw on my own experience as an attorney. I've not been involved in any cases of child sexual abuse. I've represented a lot of entities, you know, before I was a legislator, a lot of uh, businesses, nonprofits, churches, and individuals too. Whenever there's a problem, what's the first thing they often do is they contact their attorney. The attorney, what's the first thing the attorney going to do? Is going to say, don't say anything, wait until I come and take a look. It really puts a great deal of distance between the individual that is harmed and the, and the entity maybe that is somewhat or could be responsible for that harm. So I know that, that how that plays out. If we look at the grand jury testimony, there was actually a kudo played to uh, Bishop Persico of the uh, Diocese of Erie. When it was reported that he had initially, under advice of counsel, was not cooperating with some of the requests for documents, but that he himself felt like this was not turning out the way he wanted. He wanted greater cooperation. They terminated the counsel that they had, they got new attorneys, and he submitted the information that was requested. It's called out specifically in the report for that kind of cooperation. The Attorney General has often also, in his own remarks since that time, remarked on the fact that the bishop was cooperative in that instance, even though his initial response, or the initial response of the, uh, of the, um, of the diocese was not. So I believe that through all this, if we're seeking, if we say to some individuals who are victims of abuse, okay, I think our, our solution is to open up a window for you to sue, and that's your way to justice. You know, I get that that's our way to justice. That's how we handle justice in many cases in, this, in, our, in the United States, but it's still sort of a sad track. And as I'm thinking through this, reading the report, I think there must be a better way to provide justice for those who have been affected. I think that we also have a unique set of circumstances when it comes to tr past child uh, you know, uh, sexual abuse. One, we're dealing with a lot of past events, things in the past. They impact a broad sweep of organizations. We know specifically about the abuse that was conducted uh, under the eyes of the Catholic Church, but we also know that this impacted other churches, other organizations, and schools. So it's a broad swath of those pillars that are part of our society. Uh, we also see that there were changing organizational policies. Many times in the 80s and then into the 90s, many organizations that handle youth, if not all, have established policies on how to deal with accusations of child sexual abuse, and those have become stronger as time has gone on. The report from the grand jury quite rightly points out that a lot of those changes only happened after things that were concealed were revealed, but one way or another, those policies have changed. We also have new and much stronger laws that guarantee protections and greater accountability. So a lot of things have changed since the abuse of the past. It's difficult to get data on this, but uh, you know, many of the things we see 
indicates that there is a peak of child abuse and concealment that's generally around the 70s into the very early 80s and then it drops off precipitously. That would be really a time when many of these policies and then subsequently new laws came into place. So I think that there must be a better way to handle these, uh, this, uh, handle the, the, the suffering that victims have had in the past and to get the truth out which is why I have an idea of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission for Pennsylvania. That would be modeled really loosely on the Truth and, and uh, Reconciliation, uh, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa following apartheid, based on three general principles. First, the truth. First and foremost, the truth has to be out. It has to be out, out in the open. That was the, one of the objectives or the primary objective of the grand jury report uh, and of the other two uh, prior grand juries. And I would say that that would have to be the fundamental component to this commission, is the truth has to come out unequivocally with a thorough report. Second, victims have to be compensated. That's right and that is just. And it is right and just that those organizations that have been complicit, that have concealed, would pay that compensation. And then finally, restoration, that the entire process would be designed around the idea that parties would be restored. Once again, if you think back to those pillars, these organizations are pillars of our society. When they are damaged and broken, even if we are maybe not involved in any one particular of those organizations, we are all impacted by that. We need at the end for these things to be restored. People within these organizations have been living under this, if, if they are known, uh, living under this cloud of shame for a long time, and they also deserve to be let out from under that. Now the work of the commission within the proposal would start with an institution choosing to participate. This is different from waiting around to be sued. In this case, under my proposal, every organization would make a determination for itself. It would self-reflect. What do we have in our past? Do we have some abuse in the past that maybe we've not been forthright about? Or maybe we're not sure. Then they can choose to participate. They can do that by notifying the commission. The commission would then publicize all of the organizations that are participating. So there is immediate public awareness of every organization that is participating. Then the commission would hear testimony, much as the grand jury already did in the cases that we know. Uh, so here we have participation and cooperation. Since an entity chose to participate, is locked into that participation, as you'll see in a moment, then they will be a cooperative party, because at that point, they've already made the determination. So if it is a church, if it is a youth organization, if it's a school, they've already as an institution made a decision to involve themselves and to participate. At that point, they would be cooperative. They have nothing more to lose than what they've already dedicated themselves to. Next, the commission would subpoena evidence. Like the grand jury, the commission would have the authority to subpoena and to gain evidence also through, um, through other means like sworn testimony. Then the commission would verify cooperation and compliance. That's important. So number one, verifying cooperation from the participating school, church, organization, whatever it might be. And then secondly, verifying that they're complying with current laws. One of the things we see again and again in the report is in the past, how concealment occurred within these Catholic dioceses. We also see toward the end of the report uh, where the uh, grand jury speaks on what's happening now or what's, what's currently happening. They say, well, there actually have been a lot of changes. You know, we're going to kind of wait and see what happens. Are these genuine changes? Well, the commission would explore these in great detail to determine whether the organization, the church school, uh, has really uh, making these efforts. And then finally, the commission would assign uh, a contribution factor. And we'll see in a moment how that's been, that will be uh, made up and then all victims would be compensated. So the commission members, I would propose we'd have seven, three appointed by the governor, two by the Senate, two by the House. They would all serve five-year terms. Uh, we would want to have certain expertise on the committee, on the commission, so an attorney, an accountant, a psychologist, along with any other individuals that might be appointed. We would have a recommendation from ge uh, certain geographic diversity, so we don't have everyone coming from just one place, and commission members would be uncompensated other than just their expenses. Commission's duties, they would hear testimony from victims, uh, institutional officers, employees, alleged abusers, anyone who wants to testify, but all would testify under oath. Review documents and files, much like the grand jury did in the case of the Catholic diocese. They once again have the authority to subpoena. And they would report annually. Reporting is one of the most critical parts of the commission's work. Commission needs to take in the testimony, it needs to review the documents, it needs to analyze that, but it needs to then make the information public, just like the grand jury report did in the previous grand juries. 
Uh, so we would see review, evidence, and report, the most you know, critical functions of the uh, commission. How is the commission gonna be paid for? First year, obviously there's no money to start it out with, so the General Assembly, Judiciary, and the Attorney General would all contribute to the beginnings of the commission. I would anticipate they would have either contracted or some full-time staff. Um, in the second year, we would have an appropriation from the general fund. Uh, thereafter, all, all actions of the commission would be uh, funded uh, through the uh, restoration fund, which would be the contributions received from participating organizations. Now, Truth and Restoration Fund, how do the contributions come to be? So, as I said, an organization, let's say a church, decides it's going to be a participating party. Once it does, it is locked in to being a participating party. It cannot withdraw from that unilaterally. So, there will be, uh, you know, uh, as I said, there will be a, uh, a contribution that will be required to make. Uh, first, these contributions would have to be uniformly applied. You can't say, well, we're going to you know, schools are going to pay different amounts than, uh, you know, churches or something like that. Second, the contribution would be, have to be based on the extent of the abuse, the duration of the concealment, the nature of the abuse. It could be that some organizations decide to participate, but throughout, through the investigation, it becomes quite clear that maybe they haven't concealed anything. They've, they've acted appropriately. They could be let out of the program. There's no contribution needed from them in that instance. But for those that are, if there is genuine concealment, then what's the extent of the concealment? What's the extent of the abuse that occurred? Finally, or next, the financial condition of the institution. Uh, one of the issues that I have with, if we rely on civil lawsuits to get justice, if you were abused in an organization that does not have much money or much in the way of assets, what are you going to do when you sue them? First off, you're not going to get a law firm that's going to take that on a contingency fee. You're going to have to pay an attorney. And then if you get an award, who's going to pay it? So there has to be some consideration as to the financial wherewithal when a contribution is assigned. And then finally, uh, there's going to be an evaluation of the relation of the, of the, uh, the concealment to the current organization. So if you have, a, for example, a church that maybe has merged and it was one of the previous churches that merged into it, you know, there might not be complacency on the part of the entire church. The commission is also going to look at its contribution to ensure that it does not drive institutions into bankruptcy. This is for several reasons. Number one, these are pillars of our society. They are damaged. They certainly need to reform if they haven't. Uh, but driving them into bankruptcy not only adds significant time and expense uh, to victims ultimately getting uh, compensation, it harms some of the acts and works that those organ charitable organizations do. And secondly, contributions would not substantially impede religious education or charitable purposes. Now, I would mean for the contribution to be significant. Uh, it is not a get out of jail free card, but would ha also have to allow these critical institutions to continue the function that they have in our society. So I would envision that uh, the fund would be a common pool. You see different organizations. These arrows don't necessarily mean anything other than to indicate that some organizations are going to contribute more, some less. There will be more of some, fewer of others. All of them would contribute to one common fund. So that victim's compensation fund would be common, and all would contribute to it. Out of that, obviously, the expenses of the commission of itself would be taken, but no other payments would be made out of the um, fund. Then the compensation payments themselves, how do they get determined when ultimately these compensation payments are paid out to victims? One, it would have to analyze the abuse that suffered. As we know from the report, with the grand jury, there's different kinds of abuse. It would have to take into consideration the nature of the abuse that was suffered. Any prior awards, so have people been compensated from other settlements on the same claim in the past? The total number of victims, if there's one common fund, obviously if there are 10 victims, it's going to be a lot more per victim than there would be if there's 10,000 victims. Uh, and then finally, anything that might be remaining at the very end would then just be given to human services to be used for child protective services in the individual counties. So we can see it would be up to the commission really to determine how funds are paid out, but I would speculate that they would do sort of what happens in most settlements now out of courts or through insurance, and that there would be classifications. You know, if someone was abused in this way, you know, that's a classification of A. Someone who's abused in a different way, that would be a classification of B. And they might determine, determine that those payments would be made based upon classification. What's unique about this is that all victims are, are compensated. So if you were, once again, if you were victimized within an organization that 
uh, you know, maybe did horrendous things, but doesn't have much in the way of assets, you cannot expect through civil courts to claim much of anything. It's a, under the law, as attorneys, we always refer to that as a turnip. You can't get blood out of them. But if there's one common fund and everyone that was victimized in a certain way is being compensated the same, then it doesn't matter whether the organization that concealed your victimization was rich or poor. You're going to be compensated. You're going to have that compensation that you need to provide the care and so forth going forward. That is the care part of the grand jury's directive. Now, participating organizations, what I call a participating institution, how would those be determined? They're self-determined, so no one is forced into that. They would determine for themselves. Uh, obviously, they would have some abuse in their past that they have reasonable uh, belief occurred, either an employee or an agent or someone like that. Um, has an abuser been concealed? There would be a suspicion, I would think, on the part of the institution that there might have been concealment, but to start in the program, they would not necessarily have to know that. As I said, through the process, they may come to learn that actually they handled all the cases appropriately, in which case they could leave. Otherwise, they would be locked in. There would have to be full cooperations. So unlike that adversarial system that our civil courts has, where you pit one side against the other, this is instead an approach of cooperation. The institution has already dedicated itself, it's already committed, it cannot withdraw, so it has nothing to lose by everyone cooperating with the work of the commission. That is once again going to that first point, which is the truth has to come out. That would bring the truth out. Uh, it would have to be committed to making that financial contribution, which is determined by someone other than itself. So once again, if this were a Catholic diocese, whatever contribution they're having to pay into the fund is gonna be determined by the commission, they would not be able to determine that for themselves. They would also have to commit to the program prior to the 1st of January, 2020. The reason I put a deadline there is, as you know, the state legislature is considering legislation that would open a window of civil lawsuits. Uh, we don't, I don't know that that will, I don't know that that will pass, and I'll say or later, I think that it probably won't, but um, we don't want institutions to kind of just wait it out and see what's going to happen. They may need to make a determination prior to any other legislation being passed. That's important. So under that, why would an institution want to participate? Well, first, they would receive immunity from any extension or change in the statute of limitations. So claims that are currently time barred, that would be a civil claim that is after the victim is age 30. Uh, if the law changes, then the institution, once it chooses to participate, it is locked into that participation, would be immune from any changes after that. Secondly, I would say that there would be pressure from insurance companies. Insurance companies are paying significant sums under a lot of these claims, and they would certainly want the finality of these cases, I believe. Uh, so they would pressure entities to participate in the program. Third, and don't underestimate this, people genuinely do want to do the right thing. In my own experience, my personal experience as a lawyer, representing you know, different entities, businesses, and nonprofits, people generally do want to do the right thing. Their first impulse might be to conceal and hold back, and regrettably, our system kind of, you know, it really sort of incentivizes that. But if given the opportunity, they often want to do the right thing. And once again, I'll point out the example given within the report itself, the grand jury on the Bishop of Erie's own reaction to some requests for documents. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, as we're talking about a lot of organizations that are member-based, we would expect that there would be pressure from those members. I can speak for myself as a Roman Catholic. I definitely want to know the truth of what happened. I really genuinely do. As I can speak from someone who's involved in various youth activities, I want to know if there's past abuse in those youth organizations. I genuinely do. I have a real, fixed, and vested interest in knowing what that is. I would pressure the boards that govern those institutions to participate or to at least self-examine first and explain to me in writing why they are not going to participate if they aren't. So a timeline for this act, all the different components to it. You see that laid out. There are a lot of different dates here. I would point once again to December of 2019. There's a deadline for participation. Organizations cannot wait out the clock and wait and see what the legislature is going to do or what the courts are gonna determine. So even if at the end of this session, we do pass a two year statute uh, uh, window, uh, which would allow um, individuals, victims to go back and sue organizations, so forth. That's, we know that that's going to be appealed and, and go through the appellate courts. It's going to take a long time. So we want to make sure to close this window. The organizations need to make a decision and they need to commit and not wait that out. That way, we then are not concerned with what the ultimate outcome is of, say, a constitutional challenge. However that comes out, 
organizations will have already committed themselves. Then you see December 2027, uh, would be the last compensation payment. That seems like a long way out, but if you actually, if you follow uh, civil lawsuits, uh, those also extend for a significant amount of time because you've got the ultimate claim, then you've got the preliminary matters, then bankruptcy matters on top of that. So the, this schedule is one that is, you know, prevent, pr provides an opportunity for everything to come to a conclusion by a very set period of time. I would say time is running out. Right now we have different propositions within the House and Senate and they're irreconcilable. The House looks like the leadership of the House is saying, well, we're going to vote on a window of civil claims that passed last time in the House. I would anticipate they would probably pass fairly handily once again. We see the leaders in the Senate have already said, well, we believe that there are constitutional issues with that. We're not interested in a window. You know, we're interested in extending the civil claims to age 50, eliminating the statutory claims for criminals and so forth. We are not interested in a window. Those are two irreconcilable, uh, uh, two irreconcilable positions. Where they will head, I don't know, but I suspect they head nowhere. And once again, we're back into this, this ping pong between the House and Senate. We need to get somewhere beyond that, which is why proposing something that's different. And we need a solution. And I think through, if I read the report, it's, it's prepared by a grand jury. They're not policymakers. They have to act under the existing law as it is. And the Attorney General has spoken quite a bit about this as well. He's not a policymaker either. He has to operate within the laws as they are. But those of us in this building, legislators, we are policymakers. We can be creative in coming up with a solution that can give justice to the individuals, stop the ping pong between House and Senate, and truly bring restoration. So we can really be creative and provide a solution. And one final statement uh, that I want to make, you might note that I'm the only one standing on the stage, uh, which is uh, uh, unusual in these types of press events. You generally have a phalanx of other representatives or senators that are here with you. With this, because of the controversial nature of this issue, and honestly of any solution other than we're just gonna have a civil window statute of limitations change, I specifically did not ask anyone, any of my colleagues to join me. It's an election year. I don't want to subject that, them to that kind of uh, criticism from those who might disagree, because there is significant criticism of anyone that, that strays from the idea of just a civil uh, uh, statutory uh, window change. So for that, I really wanted to have the opportunity to present the proposal, let my colleagues consider it as we get ready for our session in the coming weeks, and hopefully then they would see that there's an opportunity to do something different and different and unique. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Yes. So we've seen these in like in countries like South Africa and Argentina. Yes. One. So is, is there in this country, is there much uh, precedent for these kind of commissions? So I can't find precedent for a commission like this. There have been investigatory commissions. Uh, the Archdiocese of uh, New York City actually has a, an independent committee that it uses to ascertain, you know, uh, uh, settlements out of a common fund. So in that sense, there's, there's an example there, but it's different. It's obviously exclusive just to that diocese. Uh, nothing that I know of that, you know, that would cut across all organizations. Yes. Um, this would apply to private and public organizations. Okay. Would, yes, public and private organizations can participate. So a public school could certainly participate. And if you're following the path of Senate Bill 261, uh, that was amended in the Judiciary Committee in the House to take away sovereign immunity and therefore include public schools. Whether that stays in the bill, I don't know. But once again, my proposal is to get the truth out from all entities, whether some of them would or would not be subject to future claims, I don't know. Uh, but first and foremost, we want to get the truth out. We want to get the truth out in public schools. If you see n a number of reports, there was a, a four-year study done by the United States Department of Education. It was released, I think, in 2011 uh, on public schools. In particular, it was part of the No Child Left Behind Act that revealed that there was a significant amount of child sexual abuse within our public school system and that that was often concealed to administrators and others within the institutions. So once again, unfortunately, I hate, I hate to say that the, the, the abuse does not exist exclusively within one organization. It's broad. Yes, how far, how far, I mean, how far back would this commission be looking? I think that would be determined by the commission. The grand jury looked back 70 years. The Catholic Church might be unusual in that it is a meticulous, apparently a meticulous collector of its own 
uh, you know, papers from the past. I don't know that you would see as much of a paper trail from some organizations, but you know, I would say into the past, something like 70 years, uh, where you would have, uh, still have living victims who are able to testify. But that would ultimately be determined by the commission. Yes. And this does not refer at all to the criminal cases. They would still be handled. In Absolutely. Way. Criminal cases would still be handled as criminal cases. Uh, and if the criminal statute of limitations is, uh, is lifted and uh, there are no time barring of those claims, and you know, those would be able to be pursued through district attorneys. This only involves civil claims. And actually, just civil claims against institutions, not individuals. So an abuser themselves would not find any there's nothing in this legislation that would impact someone who is him or herself accused of abuse. Only institutions that uh, would have evidence of concealment within their past. Any other questions? With that, I thank you very much for your time.